uh, Nina out the side there, and let's take our Bibles, if you would, this morning to Mark chapter number 8. Mark chapter number 8. If you need a Bible, there should be some in a chair nearby you or underneath the chair. We want you to see what God says. When you find your place in the Gospel of Mark chapter 8, would you stand with me? We like to, at our church, honor God's Word, and when we read it, we stand together to begin the message And so if you'll stand with me, I'm going to read just a couple of verses out of Mark's Gospel. One in chapter 8 and the other in chapter 15. I want to speak to you on the subject, the sinner's eternal gamble. The sinner's eternal gamble. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. Here in this one verse, Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Go with me ahead to chapter 15 in the crucifixion story as given by Mark. Mark chapter 15. Look with me to verse number 24. Verse number 24. Here the crucifixion story says, And when they had crucified him, Jesus, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for the privilege of being back in church today on the Lord's Day. We thank you for visitors that are among us. We pray your richest blessing on their lives. Thank you for the Sunday school hour and the Bible study we just went through and the baptismal service we're going to conclude with. What a joy to see one follow his Lord in baptism. And Lord, I pray that you'll help all of us to realize that sinners who do not know Christ are taking an eternal gamble with their soul. If there be any like that here today, I pray they'll see that Jesus Christ is real and that through Him they can be saved and have eternal life. Bless this message we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, the Bible condemns gambling for many reasons. Number one, we know that gambling undermines hard work by people who think they can get rich quick without working when it comes to gambling. Proverbs uh, 28 verse 19 says this, He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. That's a hard worker, right? But he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. Do you know, secondly, the reason the Bible condemns gambling is that it promotes the covetous nature that all of us are born with. Every one of us have a selfish, kind of greedy nature, and and gambling, per se, feeds that. In Proverbs 23 and verse 4, it says, Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. And another reason, I might say, is The reason that we shouldn't gamble, and gambling is something God condemns, is that it's based really entirely on man's chance. You ever hear people say, well, there's a chance you can win. Uh, Much better to live under God's control than man's chance. In our study in 1 Samuel in the Old Testament recently, we read a story about a group called the Philistines who had stolen the ark uh, from the Jews in a battle. And they had all kinds of terrible things happen to them after they stole this ark. And they decided we better give it back to the Jews because it's causing all kinds of problems. And as they got a couple of cows and they put this ark on a, on a cart, a wagon, and, and sent it back, they said, you know what, let's see what the, what the cows will do. We'll just let them go. And I want you to see their, their, their thinking, though. In 1 Samuel 6, 9, it says, And let's see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to this town called Beth Shemesh, one of the... Jewish towns, then he that hath done us this great evil, God, they're saying if God's done this great evil, we'll see what the cows do, if not, look what they say, but if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us or hurt us, it was a chance that happened to us. Well, 
there's no darker testimony to the sin of gambling than to see what the Roman soldiers were doing at the foot of the cross, as I read from Mark 15, as Jesus is dying right above them on the cross, they are gambling for the only article of clothing, the only thing he owned of any value. It says they parted his garments, casting lots. That's like dice throwing. What every man should take. Well, I have to tell you why God... Uh, while God condemns gambling, the world revels in it. Do you know all but one state in our country allows some form of gambling, whether that be the lottery, racing, sports betting, or casinos? You know the only state that's an exception to that? Utah. You've got to give credit, even though I'm not a Mormon, I've got to give the credit to the Mormon influence there that has kept gambling out of that state. And I want to say that gambling is no innocent pastime. Consider that Gambling Anonymous and the National Problem Gambling Helpline hears from thousands of gamblers who have addictions every year. One website that I read from said that 1% of America has a gambling problem or addiction. Now that might not sound like a lot till you do the numbers. There's 350 million people living in America. That's 3.5 million people with a gambling problem. While gambling for money has ruined many a family, a marriage, an individual's life, the gamble that I want to talk to you about today is the most serious loss that any gambler could ever suffer. It's the gamble that Jesus spoke of in Mark 8, 36, when He said, For what shall it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world, like in a wager, he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. He was indeed referring to a gambler who thinks he's won the, the biggest wager in his life by gaining all the things of the world, when in fact he has lost the most important thing that he could ever have, his own soul. The great New Zealand evangelist Ray Comfort, when he's preaching out uh, open air and witnessing out in public to people, I've seen him ask this question many times. He'll come up to somebody, a stranger, and he'll say, would you give one of your eyes for a million dollars? They'll say, of course, no. How about 10 million? I'll give you 10 million for one of your eyes. You know what they'll say, of course? No. <laughs> My eyes are too important. My sight's too important. He said, well, what would you give for your soul? Your soul is more important than any physical sense that you have. They might not know it, friends, or even admit it, but every sinner that does not know Jesus Christ, it, that continues to neglect or put off or downright reject Jesus Christ, is indeed taking the biggest gamble in all eternity. The very fact that there are people that put off Christ, that do not believe in the claims of Christ and His Word, the Bible, means that they are taking the eternal gamble. And in the end, they must think they're going to win. Why else would you take a wager or a gamble of any kind if you did not think you were going to win? And so today in the message, I want to give you three ways in which the sinner thinks they are going to win the eternal gamble. But I have some sad news for sinners. They're not going to win. Here's their bet. Number one, here's what they bet. First of all, that God doesn't exist. That God doesn't exist. Now, they're wagering their eternal soul on that point. And indeed, if God doesn't exist, then there is no life after this one. But I would ask the sinner who's taking this wager for his soul, is that a good gamble? Are the odds in your favor, person who doesn't know Christ, who thinks God doesn't exist? Let me see if that's a good gamble by proving whether or not God exists. First of all, you know what I would say to someone who's gambling their eternal destiny that God doesn't exist? I would say, number one, can you prove, friend, that God doesn't exist? You know, a lot of times you'll see atheist people, and there's more and more of them in our society today, and they're on the Internet all the time, they're on social media, and they're making all these challenges about this, and they're putting down that about Christianity and the Bible 
You know what I would tell them? Uh, can you prove he doesn't exist? Because really the onus is on you. You're the one claiming he doesn't exist. Can you really prove God doesn't exist? Do you know why there's always been more agnostics than there are atheists? It's even that way today in Western culture. They've done surveys. An agnostic is at least someone who will admit the obvious. They can't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that God doesn't exist. So they wouldn't call themselves an atheist. They just say, we don't know. Well, that's why. Because atheists are put in a corner to try to prove that God doesn't exist. Can we prove that God does exist? I think we can for any open-minded person. Again, if your mind is closed, you can't prove anything to anyone who doesn't want to believe it. But if their minds are open, we can. We can prove that God exists, first of all, by the argument of beginnings. Everything that has a beginning had to have a beginner. It just didn't pop out of the sky. Everything that has a beginning has a beginner. Every evolutionist, every atheist admits that our universe had to have a beginning. It could have always existed. So if it had to have a beginning, then who began it? How did it start? See, every painting has to first have a painter. And so we know that our universe had to have a beginner, and that beginner is God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's also the argument from design. I've used these many times. Some of you are familiar with them, but they're worth repeating. When you see something that has great design, great uh, complexity, great symmetry, things that aren't just exploded into something of chaos, when we look at our universe, we see too much design to deny there had to be a designer. When I see something beautifully crafted, I know there was a craftsman behind that. And with that person's mind and their ability and talent, they crafted something. That design proved there had to be a designer. And I know when I look at this universe and the amazing complexity of the human body per se, just that alone, looking at, at all the things in science and in nature and so on that, that baffle the human mind to even contemplate them. The eye, for instance, is greater than any video optic that man has ever created or ever can create. They use the eye of man to design these different cameras today because they can't make it as good as the eye, but the eye is the, the uh, model. Who made the eye then? God made the eye. There's the argument of purpose. Hey, if you don't have God existing, you have no purpose in the entire universe. We're here by accident. We're all a biological accident. We have no reason to be here, no purpose to be here. We don't have anything to live for, so we might as well check out if things get tough. That's how the world thinks. There's the argument of spirituality. Of spirituality. What I mean by that is without God, remember this is what the sinner who denies Christ, they're gambling their eternal soul off this being true. If there is no God, then there's only the physical in life. I mean, if you don't have God, you, you don't have anything divine, anything spiritual, anything supernatural. It's all what you can put in a test tube in a laboratory. That's all you have. But friends, there's a whole lot of things that you can't put in a test tube. How much does love weigh? What time is purple? You can't answer those things, can you? Because science can't give you the answers to those questions. Because they're spiritual, they're, they're emotional, they're non-physical, they're non-biological. But see, the atheist is banking his or her soul that there isn't anything but the physical, and they are making a terrible bet. Finally, I would say this. There's the argument of history. The argument of history for God's existence. There's always been, and still even today, in this so-called high-tech High technological society and world today with all the uh, social media and all the, the satellite communication, all the fast things at our fingertips. You know what? There's still more believers in a divine being today than there ever has been. We're still, the numbers are way up there. 90, some say above 90% still in the world. That doesn't mean they necessarily believe in the same deity. I'm not making that argument yet. I'm just saying that for someone to wager their eternal soul that God doesn't exist, that is a bad bet. Because so many people in the world believe in a divine being. Well, let me go on to bet number two. 
Remember, this is the sinner's eternal gamble. They're betting, first of all, that God doesn't exist. Number two, they're betting that the Bible isn't true. They're betting that the Bible isn't true. Now, I have to say, if the Bible isn't true, then everything in it can be disregarded. Just toss it in the trash like anything else that's really not worth it. If the Bible isn't true, this is what a sinner's betting on. But I would, I would challenge the sinner again, is that a good bet? Have you done your homework, sinner, to prove that the Bible is not true? That's what you better be doing, because that's what you're betting on. Consider the evidence that the Bible is true. First of all, internal evidence. For someone to say the Bible isn't true, they're calling God a liar, because throughout this divine book, we have the record of God speaking. Many times it says, thus saith the Lord. God said this, the Lord said that. So for someone to say, that's not God's word, the Bible isn't true, then they're calling God a liar. He said it was His word. Do you know the Bible was inspired from 40 plus different writers. God's Spirit inspired these writers, over 40 of them, to write down the 66 books that make up what we call the Holy Bible over a period of 1,600 years never contradicting each other. This bogus comment that the Bible's full of errors, I challenge anybody to find me the error. They never can. Their errors are not errors. They go up in smoke once you explain what the text te teaches and what it really says. So you have 40 plus different writers who often didn't even know each other who are writing a perfect document over 16 centuries. You know how long 1,600 years is? That's nearly 10 times as long as our country's existence. Close to it, eight times at least. That means over 1,600 years, many of these men who never even met each other, lived in different parts of the world, wrote in new different languages, and wrote down the Old and New Testament, and it fits together like a hand in a glove. That's eternal evidence. There's external evidence as well. How's the Bible stand historically? When we compare the Bible's contents historically, in history, how does it, how does it weigh? Perfectly. The Bible never makes any historical inaccuracies. It never has any flubs, any mistakes about history. It talks about empires like Egypt and Babylon and Rome and Greece. And they all existed exactly when the Bible says they do. How about geography? Is the Bible ever off on geography? No, not a bit. Every time we look at places in the Bible that we can now discover through archaeological discoveries, we find out that when it can be proven, and often it is, the Bible is right on target. Where places said they were, what the people were that lived there. How about science? Oh, there's all this debate about science. You know, Christianity is, is anti-science. Not so. The Bible's much more scientific than anything man's ever come up with. I'll prove that to you. When man finally discovered about 1600 or so with Galileo and Copernicus that the earth revolved around the sun and that we had a solar system, it was, it, it was not geocentric, it was solar centric. Who discovered that? Well, man did, but it already said so in the Bible. The Bible already said that the sun was set in the middle and that the earth revolved around it. Things like that the human body is made up of blood, the blood carries all nutrients to the body and waste away from the body. The Bible said the life of the flesh is in the blood. It's scientifically been accurate before man ever figured anything out. Man was finally caught up to the Bible when he says, you know, you better wash your hands in running water because there's germs. Before they were be able to invent the modern telescope, guys like Louis Pasteur and others, before those guys ever noticed that there were things you couldn't see with the naked eye that could harm you called bacteria, the Bible already told us in Leviticus, one of the first books of the Bible, wash your hands in running water. I wonder how they figured that out. They didn't need science. God is the great scientist. He's the maker of all there is, scientifically. How about prophecy? Oh, prophecy. I'm talking about external evidence. Why we know the Bible's true. The sinner's banking it's not true. I'm telling you it's a bad bet. The prophecies of the Bible, there's thousands of them. God predicting things before they come to pass. And the ones that we can prove that have come to pass are all right in order. 100% accurate. The greatest example of that is the coming of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. The Old Testament that all was written at least 400 years or longer before Jesus was ever born in Bethlehem that we celebrate at the Christmas season. 
those prophecies, starting from the very book of Genesis all the way to Malachi, they told us very detailed things about Jesus' birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, all, who he'd, who, what family he'd be born from, the family of David, the tribe of Judah, he'd come from the people of Israel, he'd be born in Bethlehem, he'd be born uh, in the time that Daniel said he would after the return of the Jews to their land. I mean, it's amazing, these prophecies. And yet, you know what a sinner's doing? Who's gambling with their eternal soul? They're saying, I believe the Bible's a lie. Can you prove that? You're going to have to. Or you're making the eternal gamble. You are gambling with your soul, friend. How about longevity? I'm talking about how the Bible's true. Do you know the Bible's the oldest preserved existing document in the history of the world? There's more manuscript evidence for the preservation of the Bible than any other ancient document. Nobody even comes close. You do the study and tell me if I'm telling you a wrong, a lie. It's been verified many times. The Hebrew and Greek manuscripts from which we translate our English Bible have the best estimation, the best uh, uh, proof of their existence from ancient times. All these manuscripts, thousands of manuscripts that prove that once these men wrote the inspired text from the Holy Spirit, remember the Holy Spirit inspired these men to write. What to write? They were like spiritual secretaries. They were writing exactly what God said. And once they wrote the autograph, which was the original, then it was copied by hand. And these copies are what we now have in existence all around the world, primarily in museums in Britain, here in America, here, there in Israel, and other parts of the Middle East. And when you compare those manuscripts, like the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in 1947 and after, they verify that the Old Testament text we use was verified perfectly to be the right text because those words were preserved for thousands of years. How about popularity? The Bible's popularity is next to none. There's no one comes close. The Bible's the all-time bestseller. There's no book that even comes close to it. It's the most widely read, widely distributed book in the history of the world. It has more language translations than any other book's ever been translated. Over 4,000 languages have at least part, if not all, of the Bible. The next book's about 200. That's right, check it out. The next book that's been translated as much as people think it has, is about 200 translations versus 4,000 of the Bible. It is the basis, the Bible is, for America's founding documents. The greatness of America and our culture can be directly attributed to the Scriptures. All of the founding fathers, if they weren't truly born-again Christians, they were believers in Christianity as a standard of living and believed the Bible to be that standard. They incorporated... Every law that has anything to do with morality was incorporated from the Bible. There's no doubt about that. And so what I'm saying to sinners who are taking this eternal gamble, they're betting, first of all, that God doesn't exist. That's not a good bet. Then they're, they're betting that the Bible isn't true, and that's not a good bet. But number three, let me close with this one. The third gamble that a sinner is taking in this eternal gamble, they're betting that hell isn't real. They're betting that hell isn't real. And it's really a bet based on the fact they hope, they're wagering on, that there is no life after death. That's what they're betting on. Remember, they're betting that God doesn't exist, because if He doesn't exist, it doesn't matter. They're betting the Bible isn't true, because then you can disregard everything it says. And they're betting there is no hell because if there's no hell, they don't have to worry about the next life. It's like, who cares? Now, this final bet is based on the previous ones. Because, of course, if God doesn't exist and the Bible isn't true, then hell would just be a fictional place described in a fictional book. But remember... I keep bringing it back to this. If the sinner is wrong on these first two bets, then he or she is making the ultimate wager to lose their own soul. Why must hell be real? Remember, they're gambling it isn't. Why must hell be real? Number one, because God said so. <laughs> that, that ought to be enough. God said hell is real. Here's Jesus' words on it. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, 
into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. In verse 46, he says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Jesus was speaking about two men that died in Luke chapter 16. One was called Lazarus. That's what his name was. The other, his name is not given. He's just called the rich man. And Jesus gives a literal story about where these two men went when they died. In Luke 16 and verse number 22, it says, And it came to pass that the beggar, the poor man, Lazarus, died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. That's paradise. That's heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. And then it says in verse 23, And in hell. He, the rich man, lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. The book of Isaiah, chapter number 5. Isaiah, who writes so much about eternity and the future, he said this about hell. Verse 14 of chapter 5, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, this is man's glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend downward into it. The first reason I know hell is real is God said so. Number two, I would say, I know hell is real because Jesus is the only one who came back from the dead to guarantee there's another life and what's on the other side. Nobody else has. People say, I believe in reincarnation. How can you prove that? Can you prove reincarnation? I believe this happens when you die. Can you prove that? The only one that can really prove it is someone who died, stayed dead for three days, and came back from the dead, and was shown by as many as 500 people at one time saw him alive from the dead. And he gave us his record of it. He tells us exactly about the next life. He's the one that implores people to turn to Him that they might go to heaven because if they reject Him, they'll go to hell. He is the only authority on the question. I believe in hell because Jesus came back from the dead. And then thirdly, I have to add this. I really had to put this in here. I believe there has to be a hell because justice demands it. Justice demands it. Hey, you know, friends, if there was no hell to punish the wicked, all the people in our history people alive right now, that commit these heinous, wicked, barbaric crimes against humanity, killing innocent children, performing such heinous acts I couldn't even mention in, in, in a public setting. And you know a lot about this stuff. If there was no hell, there would be no justice for such criminals. See, even if they are apprehended and executed as they should be according to Scripture, capital punishment is taught in the Bible, but I'm going way past that. That's not real justice. They were going to die someday anyway. If you kill a, a criminal, a rapist, a, a kidnapper, a, a mass murderer, a serial killer, you know what? He was going to die anyway. But if you have hell as a place of ultimate justice, which we must, God demands it because he's a just God. That's how I know there has to be a hell. Here's where it's described. Revelation 20 and verse 20, uh, 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. This is the final judgment of the wicked. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell, that's the body and soul. Death of the body, hell's the soul. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. What's the first death? The death of the body. Hey, if Jesus doesn't come back first, every, even Christian is going to die physically. We'll lay these physical bodies down. That's not the big deal. The big deal is whether or not you die the second death. Because he said, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me conclude the message with a gambling analogy. If a gambler heard that their odds of losing a bet, remember, losing a bet, here's a gambler, he hears about these odds, would he or she make this gamble? How about, his, how about the odds one in a million? In other words, one in a million, his odds are that he'll win. Of course, absolutely, the gamble, a, a gambler will gamble that. How about if 
The odds are one in a thousand. Sure, sure that gambler's going to make that bet. How about if his odds were one in a hundred? That's 99%. That's a pretty good gamble. I'm sure they take those odds. How about one in ten? Ninety percent. Well, I think the gambler would probably give it a shot. Yeah, ninety percent, still pretty good odds. But how about one in two? Now we go from fifty percent chance to win or lose. Now the gambler has to seriously consider what they're betting with or on. But let me go further. Now let's turn the odds the other way. Let's say now his odds of losing are more than winning. Just like with the lottery. But now I have to add this. It's not just going to cost this person who makes such a gamble a few dollars for a lottery ticket. No, it's going to cost the person his eternal soul and their destiny. Would that person take such a chance? What if the odds, as we looked at today, were that all these three things, that God exists, the Bible's, Bible is true, and that hell is real, if all those are true, is it a good gamble for a sinner to gamble their soul away? It'd be like doing Russian roulette with five chambers filled with bullets instead of one chamber filled with a bullet. They are betting on their eternal damnation. Betting that all these things I talked about are not so. But is that a good gamble? Friends, your soul is too important to gamble away. Eternity is too long to be wrong. Because once you die, you die without Jesus Christ having taken this eternal gamble. You shall forever be separated from God. But here's the great news I want to end with. Through Jesus Christ, you don't need to take the gamble. Just bet on Christ. His odds are great. He was a real person. He really lived, died, and rose from the dead. He has saved millions and millions of people down through the ages. And people like they're sitting in this building right now, myself included, have had our lives changed by Jesus Christ. And He is our Savior, our Lord, and one day He's going to come and take us to heaven. He gave us a book that guarantees it. This is His writing. He guaranteed it so. Sinner, don't make the eternal gamble. Let's pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We're going to have a time that we do each Sunday at our service, at the end of the service, where we just simply give you an opportunity to think about what you've heard today. Right where you're seated and thinking through this, you can make your own mind up. We're not here to force anything on anybody. We don't believe in that. God doesn't do that. God will never force himself on you, friend. He wants you to make a decision to follow his son, Jesus Christ, and to be saved from your sins. Everyone who's a Christian in this place right now wants to see sinners saved. If you're here today, you've never had a time in your life where you saw your sins against God, that you've broken his laws, you've lived a sinful, selfish life, but that you know that you want to be forgiven and you felt guilty enough about your sins, you're seeking a way to find God's approval and forgiveness. Well, I'm telling you the way today. The way is through Jesus Christ. If you'll give your life to Him, come and say to Him, Lord, forgive me of all my sins. I'm willing to repent. I know they were wrong. I don't want to keep living a life that's selfish and away from you, but I'm turning instead to Jesus Christ. In my faith, I'm believing that He died to wash away my sins and rose from the dead that I could have eternal life in heaven forever. And today I'm making a commitment to trust Him and be saved. That's what the Bible calls being born again. It's, a, it's an experience where your whole life is changed. It happened to me and my wife almost 38 years ago and many people sitting in this room have had the same experience. Different circumstances, different times in their life, yes, but they came to a point where they knew Jesus Christ was the answer. And they called out on Him and asked Him, Lord, save me. Sinner, if you're here, you've never been saved. Don't take the eternal gamble with your soul. Because you could go out of this place today and die in some tragic accident, get some disease out of a diagnosis this year. And be gone, as so many are, taken away from life before they even knew it, before they were ready. 
Once you go out into eternity, you'll never have another chance. We urge you, friend, give your life to Christ. If you have questions about the Christian faith, maybe all this message is new to you, we would love to talk to you further. Don't leave this place without at least filling out a, a card and let us know how we can get a hold of you and maybe contact you uh, by text or email or whatever or maybe meet with you if that's uh, possible and just give you some further information. This is too important of a decision to just hear it and walk away and forget it. I'm going to pray. We're going to stand to our feet in a moment. We're going to give you an opportunity just to think through what has been said. And if you need any further counsel, I'm going to be up here at the front while the music's playing. Nobody's going to put you on the spot. Heads will be bowed, eyes will be closed. Nobody's going to come and tap you on the shoulder or say anything to you. But if you need prayer, you need counsel, you need help, I'll be up here at the front. There's others available to help you. So after I pray, we'll stand to our feet. Some music will be playing just softly for an atmosphere to be set. But give you an opportunity to think through your own salvation. Dear God, thank you for the truth of Jesus Christ, that you do exist, that your word is true, that hell is real, that Christ came to deliver us from hell and damnation. And Lord, I pray that there's any sinner in this place that's taking that eternal gamble with their soul, that today they'll come to Christ and bet on Him. He is the greatest wager. Why would they want to lose their own soul when they can have Christ? Lord, bless this invitation. Speak to every heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.